again. The Incredibles is so good. I haven't seen the new one yet, so don't don't spoil it for me, okay? I don't know what happens. How many of you have seen the new one? 14 years in between movies. That is like, you know that they're not in it for the money. They're like, we'll make a movie, did pretty well, 14 years later, make a sequel, right? Do you know why you like The Incredibles? Because it's incredible? That's one reason. <laughs> the hero powers? I would contend that it's not that. Now, there's a lot of movies, there's a lot of comics and things out there where people have hero powers and you don't like it as much as The Incredibles. You know why? At least why I, my, my theory is. It's because The Incredibles are, they're like normal people. They're, they have powers, but we're drawn to them because they have flaws, right? They, the, the dad, Mr. Incredible, he's like overweight, if you remember in the movie. He can't get his super suit on. Right? They, the mom is like bummed out about having to be at home. She's kind of a homemaker and she's kind of pushed to the side. She isn't going to be in the action. They like fight and they, their kids don't mind and you know, they, they're running around. And, and you're like, okay, I, I, I can associate with this. If I had superpowers, I would probably have this kind of home life. This is probably what it would really be like. Now, to contrast this, how many of you growing up, your very favorite superhero was Superman? Right? That was mine. There's zero hands. Mine is the only hand right now. <laughs> Superman was my favorite superhero, and as a child, it's totally understandable why that would be, right? He has, like, every superpower that you can have. He, he came onto the scene. I actually looked up some of the, the superhero history. I'm not, like, a superhero buff. I don't, like, know everything about superheroes. But I looked it up because I wanted to know... Think, okay, in like the 20s or 30s, they came up with Superman. Now think about that like round table discussion. They're like, we're going to come up with a new category of hero. Not just a hero, a superhero. What are we going to call him? How about Superman? Oh, that's great. Let's call him Superman. <laughs> They're like, okay, what kind of powers should he have? Um, and they just start rattling him off. He can fly. He's got super strength. He can shoot lasers out of his eyes. He can shoot ice blasts, you know, with his breath. He can see through walls. Like, they gave him every single possible superpower that you could possibly think of, right? And they wrote them all down. They're like, this is going to be great. You know, we've got this superhero, and he's just like the business. He's the best. And then they had a hard time making any villains, <laughs> Because there's nothing he can't do. He's like, he's too good. He does not have a flaw. You cannot relate to him in any way whatsoever. I, I looked up a list of what his original superpowers were. And like, all these like kind of random things you wouldn't even think were part of Superman. He, he can control his voice muscles so well that he can emulate anyone's voice. Who thought of that? that? You know, it like went around the table and one guy's like laser vision. They're like, oh, that's cool. He can fly, superpower. And it got to like the 14th guy and he's like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. He, he can emulate people's voices? Ventriloquism? <laughs> you know, throw his voice. And they're like, okay, we'll take it. We'll put it on the list. You'd hate to be that guy, wouldn't you? <laughs> so like every iteration of Superman that's come out in comics and movies and whatever since like the 30s, um, they've actually been taking powers away from him because it's boring to write about a superhero who it has no flaws whatsoever. Like, you can't make villains good enough to do battle with him because all he has to do is use one of his nine million powers to defeat them. So, oh, that's weird. Oh, there it goes. Anyway, I, why do they take, you have Superman, you have like the most like muscle-bound, like, testosterone, like strong, like just like total man's man, Superman. And then all I remember, the only type of me memorabilia I remember having of Superman was Superman underwear. Now, why do you take like this, like the, this guy who symbolizes like American patriotism, like fighting for the little guy, and you're like, the one place that I'm going to display this kind of masculinity is on my, my most private undergarments. Like that's, I, I don't understand. Anyone else? I don't even answer that. Don't, you know what? Don't even answer that. Thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, like was announced already, if this is your first time or you haven't been here before or you came here a long time ago and you're just coming back again, we're in the middle of our summer blockbuster series. We don't do this every single week, and all of you are like, 
Oh, dang, I kind of wish you did do this every week. <laughs> we would hear less of you talking, Aaron, and more of a popular movie. Uh, we've done Star Wars. We've done Will the only Willy, Willy Wonka in existence, which is the original Willy Wonka with Gene Wilder. Got any agreement there? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. We've done Jurassic Park or Jurassic World, or it's something from the Jurassic Age. I don't, it changes every time, but been having a great time. Hopefully you guys have been enjoying it. We have this week, and then we have one more. I think we're going to do Thor Ragnarok next week, so definitely want to come to that. Bring your friends. It's going to be most excellent. It's going to be really fun. On the subject of superheroes, right, this idea of I mean, why did they even come to be? Why, why did it even become a thing? Uh, human beings, I, we, we long to, to have a, a person, a story. Uh, m mythology throughout the ages has always kind of um, conceptualized the, this perfect person who they're, they're morally upright and they're strong and they're powerful and they care for the weak and they care for other people and, and we're drawn to this. Human beings are drawn to the idea of a superhero. We're drawn to the idea of somebody being that way, right? Being bigger and better and stronger and, and helping in some regard. And as we get older, well, I was going to say as we get older, we start to lose that, but I have met some people who are still really into superheroes. <laughs> And if you look at the success of Marvel Comics or DC uh, in the box office, people still have that, that desire. They want to be a part of a world where there's superheroes, where there's these powerful people and there's villains and there's a, a battle to be fought. But it's interesting that typically as we get older, we start to kind of lose that wonder. And the grown-up version of that is there are people who are really good at what they do. There's these superstars and rock stars and athletes, and they're kind of our superheroes, but, but that's them, and I'm, I'm me. And you can develop this kind of sort of self-blindness. Has ever, anyone ever experienced this before where someone compliments you on something you do, and, ah, oh, oh, shucks, I don't, I don't know, it's not that big a deal. You know, uh, it's, you know I, everyone can do that. They're like, no, 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 you're really good at singing or, or painting or business or whatever you do. And, ah, no, I, I, I really, not. I, I'm, not, I'm not that good. I had a conversation with my sister just a few days ago, and she's like 99th percentile in, in painting and artwork, right? And, I mean, just so much better than the average person would ever, ever, ever be. And if you say that to her, if you say, Amber, I mean, you're, you're an excellent artist. You, your, your painting is so, it's just, it's so far beyond what I could ever even attempt to do. Oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not good. I, I'm not that good. I don't know what I'm doing. I have so far to go. I, have, you, have you been this person or have you talked to this person that just like, you have this, if, if I'm not the best in the world at it, then I, I'm nobody. If, if I can't do it better than the rest of humankind, if I'm not Superman, if I don't have... All, uh, if I'm not just absolute perfection personified, then I'm, I'm nothing. I, oh, no, don't say that. I, I, I'm not good at that at all. We kind of develop this kind of self-blindness, this, this idea that if, if we're, we're not totally perfect, then we're nothing at all. And there's, this is, today this is a, a one-point message. There's one point that I want to get across to everybody who's in here. That one point is this. You are a superhero in some area. You are a 10 in some area. You are really, really, really good at something, and you might not even know what it is, or you might have just taken it for granted, and you might have, you know, when someone complimented you on that area, you might have, oh, no, 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 it's just, you know, it's just a thing I've always done. Everybody has serious strengths in certain areas, and Lots of times we're blind to them because we just think everyone has that. No, no, I, I, everyone can do that. I can t I'm telling you, there are certain things not everyone should do. I'll let your mind just go to wherever that might happen to take you. <laughs> but it's true. Read through this with me. There's a few scriptures we're going to read, and then I'm going to give you my very best commercial for our next class. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
verses 12 through 26. We're just going to kind of read through these. I'm going to try not to interject too much in here, but listen to what Paul is saying to the church. He's talking to the Corinthian church. He's speaking in a church context. This is not like wrenched way out of context where it's uh, an Old Testament prophet who's prophesying to a nation adjacent to Israel, and, and it's something far removed from where we're at. This is New Testament. This is Paul saying, this is what the church should function like. This is what it should be like in the church. Starting in verse 12. Is it up on the board? Yeah. For just as the body is one, he's talking about the body of Christ, the church, the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Jews or Greeks, slave or free. He's saying, whatever your nationality, whatever your station, whatever your financial picture, we are all baptized into this one body of Christ. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it less, any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. We'll pause for just a second. It's easy to go into a church and go, the church is about this guy speaking on stage, or it's about this worship leader. And if I can't do those things, I don't want to do those things, that's not me. And so really, I don't have anything to do. I don't have a job. I don't have an area of service. I don't have anything to give. That's the exact opposite of what the scripture is saying. And lots of it depends on what you think church is. What is the church? Well, the church is a building that I go to, and they kind of put on this performance, and I attend, and uh, then I go home. That's what church is. That's not the biblical idea of church. The biblical idea of church is a body, the body that actually performs the ministry that Jesus started. That ministry of going into the world, preaching the gospel of Christ, making disciples of other people, caring for other people, showing the love of Jesus to the world around. That's what the church is supposed to do. It's comprised of people, not of a building. And so there is plenty to do for every person. Plenty. There is so much to be done in the church and by the church, and not just by one rock star person, not just by one superhero person. It's by the entire body. That's exactly what this verse is saying. Everyone's cut out for something a little different, but it's all to achieve this purpose. God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. In verse 19, it says, If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet there's only one body. Verse 21, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts of the body where maybe you would say, well, all I can do is, is help watch kids. All I can do is help, you know, greet people at the door. I, I don't have this education. I, don't ha I can't play music. I can't do this, that, or the other. That's all inconsequential. It says that the parts of the body that don't have quite as much to offer, it says they are indispensable. The body of Christ absolutely needs exactly what you you personally were cut out to do, that you were equipped by God to do. It's indispensable to the body of Christ. Moving on, verse 23. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, honorable, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts, which is where you wear your Superman underwear, are treated with greater modesty, which are more presentable presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no 
division. There may be no, they do that and I can't do that, or I'm just, all I can do is just kind of show up and, and attend and, and then leave and go home. That's, that's all, I, I don't have anything to offer. I'm not a superhero. It's, it's, it's saying everybody is vital for the work. There's no division. The members may have the same care for one another. Listen to this last verse. All of this is leading into this, this last verse, and this part just blows my mind. Members may have the same care for one another. In verse 26, it says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Has anyone ever stubbed their toe? <laughs> You're like going down for a, you know, impromptu spaghetti dinner at 2.30 in the morning. Oh, is that not like a normal thing? Is that just me? Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> no, you're all like, I'm not going to raise my hand or anything, but I totally do that. Okay, good. And so you're, you're walking through, and it's dark, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, you're like, it's a good thing that my toe bears the entire brunt of that. It would be unfortunate if the rest of my body were to endure that pain. No, no. You scream. You, you wake the whole house up because it, there's nothing more painful than stubbing your toe in the dead of night. You never, you cannot expect to stub your toe. It wouldn't be stubbing your toe if you expected it. You know what I'm saying? When you come into a church body, when you come into a community of what the church is supposed to function like, this is what the world is looking for. This is what humanity is looking for. Is there a group of people that when I suffer, they feel like they are suffering to the same degree? Is there a group of people that when I go, I belong to that group, and when something good happens to me, they accept it as something good happening to them? That is what humanity wants. That is what people want. And if that is what we want as a church, what you have is indispensable to that goal. What you have. You, it's not that everybody has to be doing something public. It's not that everybody has to be ripping a gut-busting guitar solo every Sunday, and that's the only way that you could possibly minister. In fact, if you ask people, if you read polls, if you look at what people are looking for in their life, it's usually not a gut-busting guitar solo. It is for somebody to be close enough to them to suffer with them and to rejoice with them. Everyone's gone through a period of time in their life. I've gone through periods of time in my life where I just need someone to be in close proximity to my suffering. They can't stop it. They can't even really alleviate it. They can't change what's going on in my life. But just the fact that someone is there, that they'll sit up at night with you, that they'll talk to you, that they will be around. How many have had that friend before? That person where you're like, man, everything is just going off the rails. It's awful. It's uncomfortable. I'm so sad. But just you being here and being around makes a really big difference. <laughs> How many of you have had something really great happen to you before and someone that you thought should be excited was like super jealous <laughs> and they wanted to bring you right back down and what's that expression, the tall poppy, you cut the, I don't remember, one, one flower is higher than the other and you want to cut it back down to bring everybody down. The church is called to be a place where people can come in and find safety. They can find real sacrificial love. They can find a group of people functioning as a body the same way that Jesus functioned when he was performing his ministry on the earth. We're not called as a church to sort of be like him or to um, treasure or be excited about what Jesus did in the past. The church is called to be the body of Christ. And so where does that leave you and where does that leave me? You might be here for the very first time and say, I don't know anything about God. That's fine. You might have like 9,000 years of, of study and an experience under your belt. That's fine too. It's, it's really not saying those who know the most are the most valued. It's saying every person has been in, 
they have some inbuilt gear, some inbuilt ability to perform what they're supposed to do, their function in the body of Christ. Now, you might be saying, how do I join this? How do I become a part of this? It all starts at salvation. It all starts at the gospel. It all starts at, am I a part of the body of Christ? And the way that you become that is not just goodwill and good thoughts and giving in the offering and whatever it might be. The way that you achieve that is you become a child of God. You are accepted into the family, the actual body of Christ. And if you're here and you haven't heard the gospel before, the gospel is that, it, the gospel actually means good news. Why is it good news? Because all of those things that we've carried around, all of the things that we've done, all of the darkness that we know is in our life, even if other people don't, God is willing to cover that. He's willing to pay for it. He's willing to actually give away his own perfect son. That was the ministry, ministry of Jesus Christ, is to walk the earth and declare the kingdom of God and to go to the cross and to not only take on, but become the sin of the world for us. If that's you and you say, I've never been a part of a community like that. I've never even known that that was an option. I never even know, knew that God cared for me in that way but I want to be a part. I want to know what that life is like. I'd invite you to pray with me. In a second, I'm going to pray a prayer, and you're welcome to just pray along. Repeat what I say. You don't have to come up here and scream something out in the mic. You don't have to uh, prepare an 18-page thesis of what salvation means. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus, God's Son, walked the earth, that he bled and that he died on a cross to take care, to pay and to take the, sun, the punishment for our sins. If you believe that in your heart and that you confess it with your mouth, then you'll be saved. I'm going to pray a prayer of confession. Pray a prayer that you may not have prayed before, but you would like to pray. And if you pray this prayer, it, what you're saying to God is, I recognize my shortcomings and I recognize the baggage that I've been carrying and I recognize my inability to make myself better. I don't have the right intentions. I don't do the right things. Most of the time, I don't even want to do the right things. I've been to places that are shameful. I've seen things. I've done things. Maybe things have been done to me that nobody knows about. That if I were to tell somebody, I would be supremely embarrassed. You're saying to God, God, if you are willing to pay for that, if you are willing to take that from me, if you are willing to change the sort of person that I am, I'll take that. I'll be part of that. I'll repent in the real sense of the word like we talked about last week. Yeah, I feel remorse over my sins but repent in the sense that I'll walk the other direction. I will be a new person. If that's you, I'm going to pray right now. Feel free to pray along with me, and then after that, we'll talk for just a couple more minutes about next class. Dear Jesus, thank you that you would choose to save me. Thank you that you would cover my sin. Thank you that you obeyed the Father, and you became a curse in my place. Jesus, I repent. You know my sin. You know my past. You know everything about me. Jesus, if you'll change my heart, if you will live on the inside of me in the deepest place, I'll be your child. I pray that you save me, that you change me, that you make me into the sort of person that you designed me to be.
In Jesus' name, amen.